So good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Di Gibb, um, and I'm here to welcome you most heartily from around the world to this webinar, which is um, uh, for the launch of the MRC Clinical Trials Unit at UCL Capacity Strengthening Hub on the Global Health Network digital platform. Rather a long mouthful, but um, you're very, very welcome to this webinar, which actually coincides almost, because tomorrow's Saturday, with uh, World Clinical Trials Day. Um, and in fact, at UCL, we had our International Clinical Trials Day um, yesterday. And there's a lot to celebrate here. And there's a few housekeeping um, rules, first of all. The webinar is being recorded and both the webinar and all of the resources, so the slides, etc., will be shared on the hub and you can see the link there. It's also in the chat. Um, so try to use the chat box to both introduce yourselves if you'd like to say hi from wherever you are and whatever time of day or night it is. And also for any technical issues, please do use it. Use the Q&A box to post questions and anything interesting you might like to say. Um, you can also post anonymously. There are a lot of participants, so we won't have um, a camera or microphones on, otherwise I think we crash. Um, they will be disabled, but there will be opportunities at the end to ask questions, both about the hub and to our guest speaker. So please raise your hand and that will enable your microphone to be unmuted. I've already introduced myself once, but there weren't so many people on then. So my name is Di Gibb. I'm um, a professor of epidemiology. I'm also a pediatrician at the MRC Clinical Trials Unit at University College in London and have worked with, I think, many of you who will be coming online in uh, doing uh, trials mainly in children around the world. And in this webinar, we're going to have two parts, a fairly short demonstration um, by my colleague, um, Kate Sturgeon, who um, is a senior nurse, research nurse at CTU. And uh, she is also the patient and public in involvement coordinator so uh, at the unit um, and at, she is the capacity strengthening coordinator so has really um, helped to drive this initiative to make our resources about trials um, available around the world um, in order to capacity strengthen and then also knowledge transfer to trial teams and units based primarily in low and middle income countries. Now we've started, as many of you know, with a soft launch um, uh, a few weeks ago, and this is our um, definitive launch today. In the future, I hope that we'll be able to share resources from many others of you. Um, uh, and it will be an evolving process. Very grateful to our colleagues at the Global Health Network who have a wide reach to many of you around the world. And we hope we'll be able to link up some of the different hubs as well. So Kate, please over to you um, uh, to start to demonstrate the hub. Thank you. Hello everyone, um, thank you for the opportunity to show our new um, MRCC to you at UCL Capacity Strengthening Hub. Um, I'm just going to share my screen. Perfect. Okay, so um, I just want to give a brief um, demonstration of our hub to give you a taste um, of what it offers. So this is our landing page um, where we just have a bit of an introduction about the aims of the hub um, and who our audience is. And then um, further down, we have a few tabs, which I'm gonna go through um, shortly, um, where we have our resources page, a contributing page, and where you can sign up to our newsletter. And then we have this carousel, which um, has um, training opportunities and advertises like short um, courses, and of course, um, 
uh, web, the, our webinar series starting today. So that's just the landing page. Then if we go into the resources page, this is where you can find all sorts of um, resources and you can filter in different ways to explore what we have. So for example, we have all these different um, categories um, of different stages of, um, the, of trials um, and also um, different aspects such as monitoring or data sharing, mentoring and different job roles. So just to show you um, how that works. So if I was interested in trial or study design, you can click on that tab and it brings up lots of different resources. Um, and we have different formats. So for example, we have um, slides um, such as this one, and we also have um, recorded presentations such as this one on um, MAMS designs. Um, or if you wanted to um, filter by disease area. So if you were interested in HIV, you can do that here and it brings up all the different resources again. And if we click on one of those, um, for example, this slideshow um, on one of our um, reality, on one of the, our trials at the MRC CTU. Um, you can also, um, if you're interested in looking just at the format of resources, so we have a format um, tab here. So if you want to look at tools and templates, you can filter there. Oh, hang on a minute. There we go. Um, and click on those resources um, and get some of our templates that can be adapted for use um, for, for trials globally. Um, we also have a whole um, set of videos. So again, you could just look in the format of resource and um, filter on videos and it brings up um, our 58 videos that we have. And again, you can just click on um, click on any of those and have a look. So that's the resources page. Um, we are planning to launch a mentoring program um, in the next second half of the year. Um, so that's from really from June, we're going to start working on that. But at the moment, you can fill out this expression of interest form if you're interested in um, being a mentor or finding a mentor. We're collecting that information at the moment. Um, and then we have a contributing page, which we will also launch during the second half of the year to think about um, other trial teams um, contributing to our um, hub and um, sharing resources as well. And on our people tab, it just gives you information on the different groups that work on this hub and then our contact where you can sign up to our newsletter. So I think that's everything I wanted to um, share at the moment but if you have any questions about the hub or how to navigate or any any other questions please direct them to the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you very much Kate um, and uh, I should also say that we're going to move to help with uh, setting up some certification of some of the resources we have obviously that that requires that we make sure that people have looked at it and understood it etc so that will also follow later on this year so i when we're going to leave questions uh until the end so i would now like to introduce our guest speaker who is my um very wonderful and long-term uh colleague and collaborator professor sarah walker who is a professor of medical statistics and epidemiology at the Medical Research Council Clinical Trials Unit at UCL. And also, she's a double professor at the Nuffield Department of Medicine at Oxford University. So Sarah has worked for many years on um, large and small clinical trials in adults and children, and in high and low and middle income countries. And her interests include the using of efficient and complex and challenging design, designs, and indeed contributing uh, considerably to uh, actually um, making up those designs. Uh, I mean, we've had 50 years of clinical trials, which have absolutely contributed enormously to improving healthcare everywhere. And as we know, they are the gold standard evidence. But most of those trials have been two armed trials and we're now in a, a, an age of, of trying to move to platform trials which can be more efficient and faster to run. And indeed they were first set up at the trials unit more than 15 years ago 
mainly in cancer and then in TB. So Sarah's going to tell us really about that today. And at Oxford, she's at the forefront of translating advances in genome sequencing into microbiology practices, um, and also looking at a wide variety of other things and, and was very, very influential in um, our COVID um, uh, monitoring during the pandemic. So Sarah, very, very welcome. Um, delighted you made time to do this important seminar. Um, and I, over to you. Brilliant. So it's, it's a real pleasure to be here. And uh, the first hurdle is always um, sharing one screen. So uh, let, let's try and see if we can, can make this work. Uh, and then I will get on with the talk. Right. So as um, Di's already highlighted, you know, randomised controlled trials have really been the cornerstone of evidence-based medicine for probably 60 to 70 years now. And the reason we randomise is to avoid bias from both known and, importantly, unknown confounders. And just to remind you that confounding is an artificial association between an exposure and an outcome. So, for example, 60 years ago, people who carried matches in their pocket had a vastly uh, higher incidence of lung cancer. And that arose as a result of ignoring a factor, here smoking, which is related to both the outcome cancer and the exposure matches. And of course, this is a very trivial example, but I think the last three years have really shown confounding or selection bias writ very large, where if you remember the literature, we went through a vast number of drugs where observation analysis suggested these might have really large benefits in terms of reducing poor outcomes associated with um, COVID. But in actual fact, really only one corticosteroids was ever confirmed in a randomized controlled trial. And that's because human beings are very good at identifying patterns. You know, and the, the tiger in the bamboo is, is the classic example. People who spotted the tiger survived to reproduce and those who didn't spot it didn't. But of course, the challenge is that these confounding biases can be very, very subtle. And that's particularly true when it comes to drugs, because there are lots of different reasons why one patient gets a drug and another patient doesn't. And we don't always capture those in the electronic data sources we, we generally then analyze. And of course, the point about randomization is that by allocating treatment by a purely chance process, you break this link. So there can no longer be any association between a confounder and a drug. Of course, we still need to randomise large enough numbers of participants to exclude the play of chance. Now, as I said, these, these randomised trials have really been the paradigm underlying evidence-based medicine. And intrinsic to all of this is the concept that there is one regimen, as I say, to, call, to, to rule them all at any moment in time. We sometimes call it standard of care or SOC. We sometimes call it a control. It simultaneously maximizes good outcomes and minimizes bad outcomes for patients. It's recommended in guidelines. It should generally be used. And then we iteratively improve this optimal regimen through a series of, as Di notes, generally two arm randomized controlled trials versus SOC. And this has massively improved outcomes, not just from TB, but also cancer. And as many of you will be aware, also from HIV over the last 20 years. And so the innovation that's really happened is, is this shift to what have been called platform designs or master protocols. So the multi-arm, multi-stage MAMS trials are just one example of these. I'll also talk briefly about baskets, umbrellas um, and factorial trials. But underlying all of these is the idea that we can get um, better treatments for patients faster by comparing multiple new things against SOC, our standard of care, to iteratively improve SOC faster. And it's as much about maximizing efficiency in how we conduct these trials as it is about this um, faster, faster improvement in SOC. 
OK, so man's multi arm, multi stage trials. The multi arm comes from the concept of testing multiple things, many relevant agents within one protocol. So if you've got four new test treatments, rather than running one trial of test one versus control and a second trial of test two versus control and so on and so forth, you just put them all together in one. And then the multiple stage part is at multiple pre planned stages within the trial. Uh, indicated by these blocks, you ask if there are reasons to carry on investigating each of these test treatments. And you can either stop arms early if they don't look good enough, a so-called pick the winner strategy, or if they lack um, sufficient activity, essentially drop the losers. And this is typically based on an intermediate surrogate outcome. And the idea is, as the trial goes through the stages, the hurdles that the test treatments have to get over get bigger and bigger. But there are other types um, of platform trials as well, and you may have heard of basket and umbrella trials. So in a basket trial, the idea is that we have the same intervention, but we test it on multiple diseases where there's reason to believe it might have similar outcomes. And a good example here is if you've got a drug that targets a specific cancer molecular marker, you might try that drug in multiple different cancer types where that marker plays a role. The alternative is an umbrella trial where here you're testing multiple interventions for a single disease stratified into subgroups by mechanism, usually molecular or biomarker, for example, cancer stratified into subgroups by molecular markers. And uh, a good example of a basket trial is ad aspirin, where we're testing aspirin versus placebo in early stage cancer, but the cancer covers a whole um, range of different um, body sites. Um, and then in contrast, moving to a basket trial, whereas in a regular trial, you would screen patients um, and those that pass the screening, uh, you know, get randomized as a whole population. Um, in an umbrella trial, the, there are multiple sub trials with different randomizations within each platform protocol. And so you might have a trial which looks at one thing in one mutation, one thing in another mutation. Factorial trials are actually the earliest platform trial at all. They've actually been going on pretty much since uh, one of Bradford Hill's earliest trial. And at its simplest, uh, a two by two factorial design randomizes each patient twice. So if you're comparing A versus nothing and B versus nothing, there are actually four possible treatment allocations. Nothing, A only, B only, or A plus B. And then for instance, if we're comparing the, if we want to estimate the effect of B, then we compare nothing and A only, so not getting B, versus B only and A plus B, getting B. And there are various extensions, um, including what are sometimes called optional or partial factorials, where some patients only get randomised once, either because they're not eligible for both randomizations or they don't want to do both of them, or a conditional factorial where one randomization is later in time conditional on something else happening. And uh, many of you will have heard of the remap cap trial um, in patients in intensive care with pneumonia. And this is a really good example of a factorial trial. Often now we talk about the different domains in a factorial trial. So in remap cap, participants can be randomized to different antibiotics in the antibiotic domain to different durations of an additional uh, macrolide, uh, to corticosteroids or not, and then there are various other domains relating to influenza, COVID, et cetera, et cetera. Now, one of the challenges is that um, antibiotic trials are really both um, baskets and umbrellas. Um, they're baskets because we're using the same intervention in multiple diseases. So we're using the same antibiotics to treat bloodstream infection, which isn't the same as pneumonia, it isn't the same as complicated urinary tract infection, it isn't the same as abdominal infection, et cetera, et cetera. But we're still using the same antibiotics. But they're also umbrellas because multiple organisms can cause the same infection and may require different antibiotics. 
And further, antimicrobial resistance means that even all patients with the same infection, with the same pathogen, may actually require different antibiotics if that same pathogen has got different types of resistance. And in contrast to, you know, the example I showed you of the FOCUS-4 trial, in antibiotics, the subpopulations are often not distinct because of this very complicated mechanism by which these organisms acquire resistance. OK, so I mean, talking a little bit more about antibiotics, I think it's really important to realise that because some of the first randomised control trials were done in tuberculosis and really there's been such a strong history of trials in tuberculosis. When we think about trials and antibiotics, we often have tuberculosis in mind, but it's really not typical of the kind of bacterial infections that we are particularly worried about today. And that's because TB is what we might call a true pathogen. It is genuinely something which causes disease in human beings. And here, if we give too little antibiotics, for example, through monotherapy or through inadequate dosing or um, you know, suboptimal adherence, then we can select for resistance arising through spontaneous mutation in someone who's got TB infecting them. But other bacterial are generally commensals. They live harmlessly on and in us and they're just part of being a normal human being, but just occasionally they go rogue and we tend to call these opportunistic pathogens. And certainly if you think about the pathogens that you might, heard, might have heard of, Staphylococcus aureus and its form as a superbug MRSA, Strep pneumoniae, Escherichia coli, to name a few, these are generally opportunistic pathogens. You can find all of them in a person who's perfectly healthy with no infection whatsoever. And it's these opportunistic pathogens that actually pose the main challenge for antimicrobial resistance that we're most worried about today. And that's because when someone takes antibiotics for an infection, Strains that are sensitive to those antibiotics, but in the commensal flora, so living naturally on the person, either in their skin, or, you know, in their gut, those sensitive strains can get replaced by resistant strains. And that removal also creates an empty space or what we call a niche where drug resistant strains from the environment, from the food we eat, from, um, you know, poor sanitation can enter into that human being. These resistance strains then spread between asymptomatic carriers as commensals. So people who aren't sick at all, the resistance strain just becomes part of the normal flora, but it's always ready to cause disease in future. And many resistance conferring genes can pass very easily between bacterial strains through this thing called horizontal gene transfer. So if we give too many antibiotics, we can lead to selection of resistant strains, not causing the infection being treated, but can drive future resistant infections independently of transmission of the resistant strain and in people other than those taking the antibiotics in the first place. And so you end up with this trade off. You need enough antibiotics to kill bacteria now, but not too many to select for resistance in other commensals, which can then cause future resistant infections. And this is a classic example of what's called tragedy of the commons, where we overconsume something that's common now, ultimately leading to its depletion and a bad outcome for everyone. So what are the trial questions? Well, I'm really going to focus on two key questions in antibiotics. I'm going to talk about what drug we should use and for how long for. And uh, in terms of when we think about drugs, you know, we know that there is increasing amounts of resistance. What this means is that we're using stronger and stronger antibiotics up front or empirically, balancing towards the individual patient now rather than worrying about resistance in the future. And we are seeing increasing numbers of multi-drug resistant infections, which have got really high morbidity and mortality. And there are lots of questions you know, about how we should be treating these highly resistant infections. In terms of how long we should give antibiotics for, I mean, evidence-based medicine would say we should do a series of trials. In actual fact, we use precedent and numbers of specific numbers. So 14 days, seven days, a week, two weeks, three days, five days, or interestingly, in countries where odd numbers are unlucky, it's usually four or eight. <laughs> 
And, you know, why do we think about shorter duration? Well, because of increasing resistance, because of the fact that most resistance we're worried about occurs in these gut commensals. Um, and at least in theory, if we give fewer days of treatment, we should reduce this co-selection of resistance. So why do we need more innovative designs in this area? Well, as I've said, randomized trials provide the most robust evidence because they control for known and unknown confounders. But really in this area, they simply aren't being done enough or they're being done quite haphazardly. And in actual fact, for multi-drug resistant infections, a lot of evidence comes from observational studies. From durations, most evidence comes from comparing these arbitrary course lengths. And just to give you four very brief examples, um, there's a new um, aminoglycoside called plazomycin. Uh, the CARE trial screened 2,000 patients with MDR, pneumonia and bloodstream infection and randomly assigned just 2% to plazomycin or plistin. Mortality was really high, 40% overall, with a suggestion that it could be lower in plazomycin, but numbers are really just too small. A parallel trial of the same drug, but versus a different comparator, meropenem, screened 640 adults and randomised nearly all of them, but had a tiny mortality. So what do you want to do here? Do you want to extrapolate from complicated UTI with a mortality of 0.2% to serious infections with a mortality of 40%? It's a really, really big, um, big, big umbrella. Uh, the FDA certainly did. At a similar time, another trial screened 802 adults. Now they've extended the definition. So we've got pneumonia, bloodstream infection and complicated UTI. Randomized a greater proportion, about half, to colistin monotherapy or colistin plus meropenem. Found no significant difference, but clinical failures were numerically lower in the combination group by about 6%. And failure rates were absolutely enormous. So 79% with monotherapy and 73% with combination therapy. Have we rejected something that actually could be quite good simply because the trial turned out to be too small? It targeted a 15%. And then lastly, you know, a trial of cofidrocol screened a smaller number of patients, randomly assigned about half to cofidrocol, but here they're standard of care was best available therapy, which was a wide range of a number of drugs. The comparator was a mixed bag. You could add the other antibiotics in. We had different primary endpoints depending on the site of infection. Um, and the authors actually stated that it was designed as a descriptive study without hypothesis testing, but nevertheless included that the drug had similar efficacy. And then finally, thinking about duration, um, a recent trial screened around 1,500 patients with bloodstream infections, so a much tighter entry criteria, randomised about uh, a fifth to seven versus 14 days treatment. And the primary endpoint was how many days of treatment they got. Now, you know, secondary endpoints did include um, clinical uh, outcomes. They were assessed together using the door radar approach, which I don't really have time to go into, but you know, fundamentally, days of treatment is a process outcome. And what you're actually assessing is did people adhere to the protocol, not, um, you know, not was, was there any impact on how patients did. So why have we got so few um, pretty small in general and frankly haphazard trials being done? My personal opinion is that whilst trials in bacterial infections suffer from a combination of problems, this issue around what should the control be, what is the standard of care, it is a key one. And if you think as a clinician randomizing a patient, this does determine whether you recruit a patient to a trial, what are they going to get? Um, I think there are also big issues around inclusion exclusion criteria, which are increasingly restrictive and risk averse. And I think there is a challenge with the frequentist hypothesis testing and dominance of type one error. Exacerbated by the fact that in many patients with infection, we never actually can actually isolate the pathogen because you don't need that many bugs to make someone sick. But that means you don't know whether or not they really had an infection. And I think, you know, many of these patients are seriously unwell, which also makes things much more complicated. 
Why not use platform trials? Why do we need something different? Well, platform trials still generally follow this evidence-based paradigm comparing multiple new things versus SOC to improve SOC. So for instance, there's a SOC in each domain of the large partial factorial trials I've mentioned. We've got very large numbers of antibiotics, very large numbers of durations with a very weak evidence base, but very strong opinions. So what should this SOC even be? And even if you choose one, it may not be possible for many patients because of this issue with resistance being generally mosaic across class. These resistance genes are carried on extra bits of genetic uh, information, mobile genetic elements, and they can swap between bugs. And many antimicrobials have important uh, contraindications. To avoid more resistance, we actually also need diversity. If we have one standard of care, which we use all the time, we will drive resistance. But that means we need multiple trials against multiple non-existent standard of cares, which many clinicians won't randomise to, many patients won't be eligible to receive because of resistance or toxicity, leading to results which aren't relevant to many patients, which come together very slowly and potentially have low power to exclude important differences. And then you go mad. So I'm going to finish by talking to about two recent developments that developments in trial design, designed to address the problems around assessing duration and assessing which regimens that um, you should randomise patients to. And the first is the durations design, now called MAMS Rocky response over continuous outcomes, and the second is practical. Okay, so how to work out whether we can use a different or shorter duration? What we've done historically is take a standard duration like eight days, for which there's often no evidence. And then we've just chosen a single shorter duration, essentially a guess as to the minimum we might think has similar cure. And then we do a two arm trial. And we're looking for non inferiority. We're looking to show that the shorter is not worse than the existing control by more than the non inferiority margin. And this unfortunately leads to very large sample sizes. So for a control event rate of 10%, if you want a non-inferiority margin that the intervention is not worse than the control by 15%, so really large, you have a couple of hundred patients, but by the time you get to 5%, you're down to over a thousand. And the reason is because what a non-inferiority margin is trying to do is to really make sure that shorter is not worse than control by more than 5%. You're trying to get the whole of a 95% confidence interval within this margin. That's quite hard and it needs a lot of patience. There's a second problem apart from large sample size, which is if you choose unwisely, i.e. you choose a duration which is even just a little bit shorter than the minimum that retains acceptable efficacy, then you've completely wasted everyone's time, including the patients, when you conclude that shorter is not non-inferior to standard. Because of course, what we actually want to know is we want to know what's going on in the gap. We want more than just two estimates. We want to understand whether the curve looks like this, this or that. And the solution is the duration or MAMS Rocky design, which essentially just does that. We use a multi arm tile to actually estimate this curve by randomizing to multiple durations between a minimum and a maximum. Then, we estimate this duration response curve using a technique called multivariable fractional polynomials. And we use this curve to estimate directly the minimum duration, which gives us a non-inferior outcome rate to the control, the minimum duration given an outcome rate of at least X percent, say. It's extremely efficient because we're estimating a curve, not just a pairwise comparison. And it's applicable to any intervention with a continuous component, e.g. dose, frequency or intensity. Uh, it's been implemented in the PEDICAT trial, which has now recruited more than a thousand uh, young children uh, with uh, hospital uh, with, with severe pneumonia treated in hospital. And uh, hopefully we'll be publishing the results uh, towards the end of this year, beginning of next year. So the second uh, development is the practical design. Um, 
And so this really has been motivated by this particular type of um, bug called carbapenemase producing Enterobacteriaceae. And these are organisms which are resistant to, if you like, what would previously have been called our last line of resort, the carbapenems like meropenem, imipenem, and hertiperum. And the challenge is that the patients who have these kind of infections are generally quite complicated. So these are eight patients across the top here who have various types of infection, various types of mechanism, various types of um, you know, other comorbidities. And these are just some of the ideas that people have had about how you could treat these patients. But what you can see is there are lots and lots of no's as well as lots and lots of yeses in whether these specific eight types of patients could take these particular type of drugs. And of course, what a doctor wants to know is out of the things that this patient could actually take, what's going to give them the greatest chance of success? How the things that this patient can actually take might compare to another antibiotic that this patient can't take is irrelevant whether or not that other antibody is someone else's standard of care. And arguably, given the high uh, mortality and morbidity rates, choosing something which is likely to be one of the best out of the multiple available options for this patient is more important than identifying the very best treatment. What we really want to do is avoid things that are really bad. And I would argue this reflects the clinical compromises that physicians are making continuously in this umbrella and basket antibiotic situation. So in a traditional platform design, there's still one SOC which every patient has to have the potential to be randomized to. We may well test multiple intervention arms which can stop or start while the platform trial continues and the SOC may change to one of these test arms. Patients may not have to be randomized to all test arms, but the primary comparison is still a pairwise comparison with SOC in a patient who happens to be randomized to SOC versus each test. And the difference with a practical design is there is simply no SOC. Each patient is randomized between a subset of regimens, but those subsets differ from patient to patient according to their characteristics. And so here, for example, the first patient might be randomized between these five regimens, but each one of these other patients is randomized between a different set of regimens that is relevant for them. And those of you with eagle eyes should spot that there isn't one single regimen which is in common to each one of these lists. The analogy is with network meta-analysis, which many of you will have heard of. A network meta-analysis combines evidence from multiple trials in which different pairs or sets of treatment are compared, so as an example on the right, to answer question as what is the best treatment to recommend across the network? What's the ranking of available treatments across the network? A practical trial combines evidence from multiple patients in which different pairs or sets of treatments are compared exploiting both direct randomized, but also indirect evidence across the network in a statistically principled way. And there's a real paradigm shift here because sample size is now determined by how much information you gain compared with the current status quo, which is essentially a randomized selection from the personalized randomization list. It's not based on pairwise hypothesis testing. It does have to be simulation based. And you end up with statements like, compared with selecting a random regimen for each individual, if we use the top ranked strategy based on the information gained from a trial, including 3,000 individuals, we would get 80% of the maximum possible reduction in mortality for each individual, with 90% chance of mortality being within 2% of the best strategy, just as an example. But the information you gain follows the patients. The trial provides more information about the ranking of pairs of treatments that more patients are randomized between. And essentially, it's this concept of trade-offs. If you think about mortality on the x-axis and resistance or cost or toxicity on the y-axis, the SOC paradigm is trying to identify the very best out of all these regimens. But if you can't take D, it doesn't 
really help you. Whereas practical designs are really trying to avoid the worst so that doctors can make the trade-offs out of what an individual patient can take. And an uh, example of this trial is the, is the, is the NeoSet1 trial, where we're thinking about uh, eight or nine different first line regimens that each site will uh, select uh, into groups based on site factors and baby factors. And then children will get randomized and be treated and hopefully clinically um, cure and improve. Now, I am just going to take a couple of extra minutes to talk about a last type of design. And that's really a design which addresses this question, what happens when things go wrong? So if we randomize a patient in any trial and the patient doesn't improve, what do we do then? Well, you're going to switch antibiotics. And essentially you have two choices. You either force a choice in your protocol or you have a free for all. And you have two types of analysis then. You can do an effectiveness analysis where you just say the kind of regimens patients will switch to are like those that patients will switch to outside of the trial. This is the free for all. So we just ignore post randomization switches and try to estimate the impact of starting with something. Or we can try and do something more sophisticated and do an, an efficacy analysis. If in doubt, of course, what um, the literature would say you should do is always try to randomize. And this is my last type of design called sequential multiple assignment randomized controlled trials or smart designs, which basically answer what if questions. So here at a decision point, rather, rather than trying to force something, or allow a free for all, we essentially randomize again. So here we might randomize to stick or switch to stay on the same antibiotic or switch to something else. And then we use probability weighting to get overall estimates of the impact of different combined strategies. And so in my NeoSet trial, babies who clinically deteriorate or don't improve when they start first line antibiotics will actually get randomized again um, to a set of second line treatment options based on what they got first line. So some final thoughts on antibiotic trials. Well, although you might imagine there is, there actually is little or no evidence for the duration of most antibiotic courses. And uh, the durations or now for MAMS Rocky design was developed to fill this gap. There's a lot to do, but we've got some exciting trials coming through using it. And the current mostly single comparator trials aren't designed to answer the urgent public health question identified by WHO, of what we should be really using to reduce morbidity costs and mortality in these multi-drug bacterial infections, because there isn't a standard of care people randomise to. And the practical design again was developed to fill this gap. We've still got a lot of work to do there. I think these smart designs have got a really important role to play in testing whether we should use the strongest antibiotics first or escalate only if needed approaches. And they're also much more widely applicable. And I think my final thoughts on trial design in general is that it's really important. We're not trying to have an innovative trial. We're trying to answer the largest number of the most relevant scientific questions about causes and effects using the most efficient trial design in a way that's relevant to the most patients. Um, a criticism that lots of people have is that they're very complicated and I'm sure that will come up in questions. I think my final thought is that for every complex problem there is a simple solution and uh, it's almost always dead wrong. Uh, so thank you for listening and I look forward to, to, to hearing your questions. Thank you very much, Sarah, um, for uh, a lovely talk. Um, I think what we all do is to take, we've got some time for Q&A, so keep putting questions in the question and answer. Um, I think we'll take some questions for you first and then go back to the hub uh, for some questions for, for Kate. So there's a, there's a few questions in the, in the chat boxes. Um, so from Abbas from Emberara, uh, he's asking, and I guess it's relevant to say, you've mainly focused on, on uh, novel designs for, for antibiotic use, but he's asking about decisions about standard of care in non-TB resistant trials, especially there are multiple national guidelines or national 
yes, uh, there are multinational definitions of standard of care, which is very wide among clinicians mm -hmm. following different protocols. So I guess he's asking in a more general way, um, what about uh, other disease areas, particularly perhaps mm -hmm. in low and middle income countries, and I can think TB is obviously an important one where duration is important, and maybe malaria. Um, you got any thoughts? Yeah, so, so I mean, I, was, I think it's a really critical point, and I think there are two things you've got to trade off. Um, one is efficiency, and, uh, you know, in that, if there are two things that clinicians will randomise to, and you only randomise to two things, you will get a much more precise answer about their relative benefit. So if the different standard of cares are close enough that you can come to a common understanding about something that most people will randomise to and most people will accept, then comparing one thing against that will always give you a more precise answer. The situation we're in with antibiotics just isn't like that. And I think if nothing else, the, the most important message to get from this talk is that there really isn't one size fits all. You've really got to think about your specific indication and the problem you're trying to solve. And the design that works for that may be very different to the design that works for antibiotics. Um, so, so it's really this issue about efficiency of, of statistical comparisons and then practicality of, you know, what clinicians will randomise to, patients will randomise to, what questions need to be answered. And I don't know enough about multidrug resistant TB to, to make a judgment there. But I can tell you that these trial designs are being used in a lot of different areas. So, for instance, in durations, there's actually a trial looking at some of the new cancer drugs and how frequently you should look, you should be giving them called Refine. There's actually a durations of UTI treatment trial just starting. And for the practical design, we're actually um, we've submitted a, a design uh, testing different anti venoms for snake bite in Africa actually uh, today. So, you know, I think, the, you know, there are other applications of these designs that are really important, but they aren't for every question. Sarah, just as a quick follow up to that from Shafiq, mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> he's asking <clears throat> about guidance for clinicians deciding what the, S, the SOC regimen should be mm. and saying, isn't this design susceptible to biases? So maybe you could just quickly answer that before we go on to many questions that people are asking. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, remember, when you talk about bias, you, you, there's, you, there's still a randomised comparison here. So in, in terms of systematic bias from known and unknown confounders, then randomization breaks that link between confounding. So you can't have systematic bias. Remember, if you don't randomize many patients, you can always have bias from stochasticity or what's called random bias. So randomization always stops you having systematic bias, but it can't solve the problem of small numbers. In the network, it's certainly true that if you think about what we're doing, um, we're using both direct evidence between patients randomized between A and B, but if you've got patients randomized between A and C and C and B, then you can use that indirect evidence as well. Where it can go a bit wrong is if you've got very strong interactions, so A only works in patients who are men, for instance. That's also true in a standard two arm trial. So the practical design doesn't really have extra problems, but it does still have some of the problems of a standard trial design. But you don't have the confounding bias that you always have in observational studies. Thanks, Sarah. So just moving on, we have lots of questions coming in. Um, wonderful talk from, this is from uh, Bruno. Um, He's asking about the ethical issues surrounding this type of trial. And I guess uh, he, he's particularly asking about deferred consent of patients who might be in ICU, yeah. but also perhaps for ethics committees mm -hmm. and also uh, participating trial teams, understanding these designs. Um, uh, what do you have to say to that? Thank you. 
So, I mean, I think it was something that when we wrote the protocols for the first two, both durations trial and um, practical trial, we were really concerned about. Interestingly, what we found is that ethics committees responded very positively because they really understood the problem that we were trying to solve and why a two arm or even a man's trial couldn't address that problem. And I think, you know, in terms of in terms of patients, the critically important thing is to be honest, which is that actually there are a lot of different things and genuinely doctors don't know. Um, and it's very interesting if you talk to the people who run the very large man's trials, they were also concerned about this. What they actually found is that patients responded very positively to the understanding that actually there are lots of things we don't know rather than, well, there's just this existing thing and this new thing and we don't know which is better. And the patients are like, well, you kind of do, don't you, because it's the new one. But when you say there are 10 different things and we don't know which better, patients are like, you really don't know which is better, do you? So I think and I end up by saying medicine's really complicated. Yeah. You know, doctors are doing a lot of things to patients, not usually just one thing. And I think we over we, we make trials appear more complicated than they necessarily are in the context of medicine as a whole. Honesty is key. Transparency is key. Working with PPI groups is key. Thank you, Sarah. So a few more interesting questions. So Ahmed Ali asks, how far artificial intelligence and machine learning could uh, um, enforce and develop clinical trial platforms? And do we need clinicians to all learn AI to enhance and accelerate this? So, I mean, I, I think there's some really interesting questions there. So I think you can think of AI as an intervention so, you know, in terms of clinical decision support, and I think there's definitely some potential there. Um, I think what lots of people have wondered is whether AI is enough to get rid of trials on the grounds that if you can get a very good prediction of outcome, do you need to run the trial? And I think, you know, because I'm aware of time, but, you know, very briefly, I think my response to that would be it's really important to understand that artificial intelligence just cares about making a good prediction. If the prediction is based on confounding, it doesn't care, yeah? And then the problem is if you've got a good prediction which is based on confounding in this data set, you've got to assume that that confounding is going to be exactly the same moving on. So going back to my toy example, I'm sure an AI would have told you carrying matches, you're gonna get lung cancer. And 60 years ago, that was right. But 40 years ago, everyone had electronic lighters with gas fluid. Yeah. So you, you've got to make that generalizability assumption. So I think like most tools, it's got enormous potential, really quite big pitfalls. And we're going to spend the next 20 years working out how to manage them. Thanks, Sarah. James Seddon asks about stratifying treatment based on patient characteristics and baseline, such as radiology or biomarkers. But I guess here you're talking about possible basket trials because they might be. Well, and, and so, I mean, I think, James, what I would say to you is it, 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 the practical trial design inherently has got some of that personalization in it. The difference and where a practical design is is, is most relevant is where firstly the personalization isn't over, isn't absolute yeah so you actually have a lot of overlap and that's the case in our neonatal sepsis trial where the regimens we're looking at really span a very broad spectrum some babies will be randomized between the broader some will be randomized between the narrower some will be randomized between the middle but again because of mosaic resistance that's not absolute and that's where you can really gain power i think the other thing is that you know you have to assume that there really aren't strong interactions so that even if this type of patient mostly gets these regimens if A is better than B, A will be better than B in that group and the other group as well. But as I said, you know, that's actually also implicit in two-arm trials where we don't worry about all the other aspects of management that we don't randomise, but we just assume that there aren't any interactions, which is also probably not true. Great. 
Okay, so um, moving on, Timothy asks about um, informed consent mm -hmm. and in your, your experience so far. I mean, I think you've answered the question in some ways in, in that we know that um, uh, patients were really interested in asking more questions in one trial than just two, but informed consent in these more uh, complicated designs, what's your experience so far? So I mean, so I mean, so far we we are not um, we've got ethics approval and we've developed participant information sheets and we, we've had the kind of conversations locally. I can't give you the definitive answer because the randomization in the huge practical trials, it, you know, it hasn't it hasn't yet started. I think I come back to my point, which is honesty. There are these different things. They've got different risks and benefits, and we don't know which is the best we will be randomizing you between more than just two of them. And the experience of the man's trials, which at least from the point of view of the participant, isn't so different, yeah? There are lots of different things, just one of them you might get outside of the trial. I mean, that's true also in a practical design, each one of these babies will get something. It will just essentially be chosen at random from their randomization list, rather than one thing being recommended in guidelines. So, you know, I think there's still work to do, but but again, you know, transparency, um, transparency with patients about what we really don't know, even if that's uncomfortable and how the choice will be made by a computer, I, I think is the, is the critical part of all of this. And actually quite interesting, I'll just add, Di, um, it, it, it's really difficult, but actually antimicrobial resistance, at least, um, in high income countries, it's quite prominent in people's thinking now. And people do have worries about their children and what their children or their grandchildren will have to be treated with in, you know, 50, 60 years time. And as long as you're looking after the individual baby now, clinically and really monitoring them closely, many people do have a very societal view of the value of antibiotics to society as a whole, as well as to their individual child. And I think we've just got to be more honest about these trade-offs so that we don't know it all. Thanks, Sarah. Um, we are coming up to the hour, although we can extend for another 10 minutes. So um, I think I'm gonna go on because there's a really interesting discussion going on, but I may intervene because there has been a couple of questions directed at Kate. But Gareth is asking about uh, the role of pharma because um, uh, repurposing drugs that are already licensed may be one thing, but new drugs, what, what's your views about um, how pharma would uh, join in with the game, especially if there they're are head-to-heads going yeah. on? So, so I, I mean, I think that's a really critical question, Gareth, and those kind of discussions, um, you know, with, with regulators like the FDA and the EMEA are just starting as we start to, to, to bring these trials through. I, I mean, I do think the, the critical question is always multiple pharmaceutical companies. I think one company and a bunch of repurposed drugs or existing licensed drugs is always much easier. I think it's also easier when drugs are not given in combination, because if you do simply have one drug, Pfidrocol, it's much easier to assess the toxicity associated with that than if you have Pfidrocol plus amicacin versus something else. Um, I think ultimately many people um, working in drug development would however recognise that the current status quo is actually pretty terrible and that Pfidrocol trial I think was genuinely uninterpretable because you know you don't really know what you were comparing it against in in three different indications with three different primary endpoints and you know 40 different standards of care and so I think there is a place to argue that, that um, uh, you, you know that anything that is more robust and reliable is better than that and and again, you know, regulators, it may well be, Gareth, that what actually happens is that you get a license based on a complicated UTI trial, which is easy to recruit to, has low mortality. And then we take that licensed drug into what you might think of as the more clinically relevant questions in a practical design, which isn't then a pharma led trial. And I think that kind of phased approach may well be where we land. But, you know, I think it's going to be an interesting 10 years trying to work that out. Thanks, Sarah. And Julia's asking, 
can you comment on the role of adaptation? Because clearly mm. funders are beginning to say, we want a, a platform trial that's adaptable. Mm -hmm. um, so for example, the, the response adapt adaptive randomization, considering that we need to be using some of these novel trials for at least a relevant proportion of trials in, in infection. So mm -hmm. how do you incorporate that into these novel designs? So I think there are different types of adaptation. And I think, again, it's not a one size fits all. So I think that the, the main challenge with response adaptive randomization, um, at least outside of practical design, is that clinicians are not actually stupid. And what response adaptive randomization assumes is that no clinician will notice if instead of approximately one in two patients getting the new intervention, suddenly five out of six get it. And the whole point of having a data monitoring committee is to make sure that other biases in how patients are managed aren't influenced by how people think the groups are compared. Because if there was no problem knowing that currently the estimated treatment difference is the new intervention is 80% better, then we'd just be telling everybody that all the time. And all response adaptive randomization does is tell people that all the time. So I think that's a piece that I would really park. In terms of stopping and adding arms, I would argue that trials with a data monitoring committee with the ability to stop or add arms have always been adaptive, at least where the DMC has exercised um, you know, that responsibility. And this kind of trial design is no different. So in the durations design, yes, the DMC thinks very carefully about whether the lowest duration is safe to continue. And if it wasn't, they would stop it. And similarly, in a practical trial design, there are ways to make them adaptive. So you drop things that genuinely look completely futile and you would never use it, even if it was the only option possible. Um, so I think all of these things can be adaptive. But again, it's about the right tool for the job. So what are you trying to respond to? What are you trying to achieve? And then what kind of adaptation can you put in which doesn't introduce bias and allows you to achieve that goal? Rather than just saying we need an adaptive trial, like we need an innovative trial, yeah. Thanks, Sarah. And of course, it does bring up the issue that IDMCs have to work quite hard with these trials. They're not always simple to do these trials when you're dropping arms and picking new ones up. That requires a lot of work at the core of the core teams, but also of the oversight committees. Isn't that true? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's, it's just a point because everyone's thinking they can all run adaptive trials on a shoestring. Paul Heath is asking, thanks for an excellent talk. Could you comment on choosing trial endpoints? Mm -hmm. um, uh, where you know you might want a hard endpoint, but they're rare. Um, and uh, uh, therefore, you're choosing biomarkers, etc. Um, I guess this is a an issue about um, how well your biomarker is really telling you what's going on. Well, I mean, honestly, Paul, that's a whole other talk. Um, I, I think it's really challenging. I think you know you you have to have something which is common enough in order to think that the information you gain is worth it. And, you know, what I would say is these practical trial designs, you know, the sample size is simulation based. So it is actually a big overhead and it takes a long time. But I think it gives you a much clearer idea about how much information you'll get rather than the very quick, you know, 20 percent versus 15 percent. Oh, that's too big. So let's just go for 20 percent versus 10. Ten seconds later, we're done. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, the key thing about a composite endpoint is to really be confident that you at least think the different parts of the component are as important as each other to show a benefit on, even if they've got quite different levels. So, you know, mortality and hospitalisation, fine. Mortality, hospitalisation, emergency visit, fine, probably. Mortality, hospitalisation, emergency visit, O2 sats less than 93%, as in the metformin trial of COVID, probably was not a good choice. Um, you know, so I think, again, it's very much about your specific disease area and what you really think clinically um, 
it, you know, it, it is going to show the right difference. And I think, you, you know, that, that there's definitely more work to be done in this area. Maybe the next talk, Donna. Yeah, sure. So Stefania is asking, um, would it be possible to apply these designs to understand the right time and balance between using antimicrobials and immunomodulation? And I guess here what she's getting at is these might be using different drugs which have different mechanisms. And in the mm -hmm. past, we have uh, might, might do a factorial with that, like, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. uh, uh, for example, so you retain efficiency, but they're also going to be part of MAMS trials as well. And um, we have been talking about how you combine these different designs yeah. like MAMS and factorial and duration. Yeah, no, well, I mean, and, yeah, just to add the other one, of course, I think if you've got a what if question, then actually these smart designs can be very powerful. So if, if you've got a question like, well, should I start up front with immunomodulators or I can't even remember what you antibiotics. Antimicrobials. Antimicrobials. Your favorite. <laughs> yeah. So which way around first or both together? And then when should I switch? Again, you can use the smart design to really try and do that in a very, in a much more rigorous way. So I, th I think it's really about probably brainstorming all the different ways you could use these different drugs and then looking at the list and thinking about what's the randomization that would allow me to estimate that in an unbiased way. Um, but I think, you know, one of the challenges with trials is that at least in theory, you can use every design for everything. I mean, you can always do a cluster randomized trial. It's just not very efficient if, you're in, if your intervention is delivered at an individual level. Yeah. So you can always do everything, but it's about efficiency and it's about bias. Thanks, Sarah. So Ollie is asking, how large is the problem of neuroantibiotics? only having been indirectly compared to no antibiotics via a chain of non-inferiority comparisons. I guess that's in the past. Yeah, and I mean, I, I, I think for antibiotics, you know, there is, there is at least some evidence that if somebody has a bloodstream infection and you don't treat it, their mortality is 90%. So, I mean, you know, and I know it's old and it's case series and you can worry about it, but I mean, I think serious antibiotic, um, sorry, serious bacterial infections are, are one area where probably we don't have to worry too much about that. But I do think where I would really agree with you, I think that what, what it means is that if we can use designs like these practical designs to directly assess older versus newer antibiotics, that's an opportunity that we shouldn't ignore and just assume that the older ones are fine and that you know, just compare newer versus slightly less new. Thank you. So Ibrahim asks, and my screen has just jumped, sorry, because uh, of so many questions. For basket trials, are stages of conditions being studied considered? So I think he's thinking about different doses of the same drug and how that's handled. Um, uh, I so guess I think, that, that yeah. those would be slightly different interventions and you might want to look at that um, in terms of dosing. You might want to nest PK studies as well, which we do a lot in children. Yeah. So, I mean, again, but I come back to my basic point about um, you know, efficiency. If you're in the phase two scenario where you're really just trying to ask, you know, what, what dose should I be you know, taking forward? What dose I should be using? then a standard MAMS where you have the multiple doses versus a single comparator makes a lot more sense and will be much more efficient because you have the direct comparison. And if somebody can take the drug, they can take any dose of the drug, you know, at least in theory. You know, I mean, I think some of the questions about, you know, higher dose of rifampicin, say in, T in TB, you know, low dose is standard and that's what you would get. And so there's no reason not to use a, a, two, a standard two arm design again i come back to if you're trying to bash a hat a, a nail into the wall you don't use a spanner it's about understanding what's the problem we're trying to solve and given that what's the most efficient design for that problem rather than the goal being innovation or adaptation you know per se yeah i think funders sometimes need to understand that yeah, I agree. <laughs> so Malene is asking, uh, regarding analysis, do you find Bayesian approach more appropriate than classical? 
Yeah, so for the practical trial design, the analysis is Bayesian because it's based on ranking. You know, the idea is to say, you know, what, what are the rank, ranks of these um, different treatments against each other? And that has to be done in a Bayesian format. For the durations trial, we're trying to estimate a dose response curve. I mean, you can estimate that with an uninformative prior and you'll end up with an estimate which is pretty similar to a frequentist prior. I mean, I, I certainly would agree with you, I think, um, particularly in non-inferiority um, trials, even just standard two arm ones, it, you know, given that what you're trying to do is get a confidence interval within a bound, but a confidence interval can't be interpreted probabilistically, there's huge value in thinking about Bayesian analysis. And Michelle Clements, I don't know if she's on the call, has recently had a paper in New England Journal of Medicine Evidence, you know, looking at that and a, an a, and a approach called an accept approach, where you actually try to estimate the probability that your new, um, you know, your intervention is no worse than control by X amount or Y amount. Um, but I don't think it's either or, you know, it's very easy to get trapped into this, it's this or that. I think it's about the information you gain and how you can present that and what you can learn and they both have value. Right, Sarah, these, these next two questions are literally a 30 second answer and then I'm gonna move over to Kate. So Carlo asks, um, what can the role be of, I think RWD is real world data, I'm not sure what EMR is, yeah. to complement or follow up an, an adaptive platform? Yeah, so I, I think it can always complement Carlo. I think if you genuinely can't randomise, it's all you've got. I think the huge challenge, as COVID showed, is what factors make a clinician give one patient your new drug and another patient your old drug? which are not recorded in the electronic data sources. And the key one is this patient looks really crook. And yeah. so I think that's always going to be a problem. Yeah, sure. So then, yeah, absolutely. Uh, James Watson asks, oh, sorry, he's just jumped. Um, uh, what's your opinion on pre-specifying hard stopping rules versus having regular interim analysis where the DSMB can decide? Um, uh... I think the future is incredibly hard to predict and the problem with a hard stopping rule is that you may end up regretting it and you only know that after the trial stopped. So my preference is to choose DMCs very carefully and then to trust them. Right, lovely. Kate? Um, there was a couple of questions about mentoring, I think, and I don't think I've seen other questions about the hub. Thank you so much, Sarah. And then I'm going to wrap up. Kate, do you want to comment briefly about mentoring? And I'm really sorry I didn't quite get all those questions in. If the questions could, uh, well, I think we'll just uh, uh, direct to me and we can direct to Sarah afterwards. Thank you very much. Um, yes, um, someone asked if there were costs associated with the mentoring um, scheme and resources and is there a criteria for eligibility? So there are no costs associated with it, but we will be um, trying to work out the best way to do a good matching process to link mentors and mentees. So there may be some criteria around that. So it's done appropriately with the right people matched via their role or experience. Thanks, Kate. And I think also we, we're aware that a number of uh, groups are running mentoring programs, aren't they? And so, for example, the young people in the Penta group are thinking about that. And we just will we'll hopefully do some joining up via this wonderful hub so that um, uh, there's not lots of duplication and everyone gets totally confused. Yeah, um, I'm going to wrap up now. We've actually gone over by a bit, which we thought we might do. Again, in the chat, uh, Louis has put the um, hub uh, link. Please go and look at it. Tell us also how good, bad or wonderful it is. Give us suggestions. Um, somebody's already asked about certification. We haven't sorted that yet. Um, we're still, we will be adapting and doing things as we go along and putting up uh, resources and hoping that we can signpost you well because I think that's the biggest issue with these kind of online uh, resources is is we hope in the end that if you are 
um, a research nurse in um, in an in somewhere in Africa that you can click on that and get things up that are going to be relevant for you, and also make links maybe with other other platforms. Uh, there, uh, and at the same time, you can look for something very much more uh, more focused if you want to. So that's the idea. We um, are immensely grateful for everyone that's joined. We had a um, some, something like 300 plus registered and 200 plus got on, on. Thank you so much, Sarah, for a, um, an inspiring talk. I would just add that however complex things look in terms of design, et cetera, we have to hold on to the importance of being efficient the importance of getting results out faster. I mean, I say that with a paediatric hat on because kids are always left behind. And that actually on the ground, what looks like a, a relatively complex design can be very straightforward in terms of that patient in front of you. They understand there are a number of different options and that they're going to get that best care, um, uh, which, which is it is within a trial because we don't know the exact answer. So um, I'm going to wish you all a very good day. Um, thank you for joining us. Continue to have a look at the hub um, and uh, to to uh, chuck your questions at us, and uh, uh, we hope to be responding and seeing many of you all soon. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye.